Well, welcome to 7501 NCS Airline Management. And today the lecture is about analytical tools and enterprise risk management. It's a synopsis lecture. Uh, synopsis lectures uh, are uh, extremely good with regards to presenting the facts to you, but for review and reference purposes, please use the full lecture. Uh, I have the single dancer up there to say, it's a lot of fun here dancing on my own, but it's a lot more fun uh, dancing with other people in the lecture hall. Where are we up to? We're up to week nine, analytical tools and enterprise risk management today. And this is what we're going to cover. So let's have a look at the lecture. Firstly, analytical tools. One of the eight principles of quality management is to take a factual approach to decision making. And there's many, many ways to make effective decisions based on data analysis and information is a very good way uh, to aid the decision making process. And there's a range of tools that we can use for this and they're shown here. Today, we'll just look at a few of them. We don't have time to cover all of the analytical tools, uh, but the few that we cover, I believe, uh, are very worthwhile for you to have some understanding of. Firstly, systems thinking. Uh, organisations are a system and you must apply systems thinking to understand them. It's based on the belief that the component parts of a system will act differently when one element in the system or the external environment changes. So it's understanding how things influence one another within a whole. If we have a look at a car rather than rather than uh, saying it has four wheels, an engine, etc., uh, we see the whole car. It's operating as a system. Gordon Bethune said, which part of this watch, meaning Continental Airlines, don't you think we need? And he needed all the parts to improve the airline's performance and to make sure all parts were working efficiently and effectively. System thinking is what you do when you are looking at trees and you see beyond them to see a forest and much broader interactions with the ecosystem of which they are a part. It requires a level of, the, of intuitive and creative thought. And like all analytical tools, you need to scope the problem and understand the underlying circumstances to come up with how the system may be once the changes have been made. It's like a balloon and you're about to hit it with a pin. If you don't understand what the re uh, response or the reaction to that will be, you don't understand that you're dealing with the system. So make sure you know what is likely to occur if you want to change the equal equilibrium. Let's move on to root cause analysis. Uh, it's a quality-based system which relies on establishing the root causes of a problem. The symptom at the top we see, we see the weed, it's above the surface. Uh, but below it, there's all of these underlying causes, the root, uh, and they're not as obvious uh, as the weed itself. The general principles of root cause analysis are establishing the root cause is more effective for fixing a problem than just treating the symptoms. So if you fix uh, the symptoms, it means it won't recur again. Any analysis must be conducted systematically with causes and conclusions backed up by documented evidence. There's usually a number of root causes rather than just one. And the analysis must establish all known causal relationships between the root causes and the defined problem. Let's move on to the five whys. Now that we've, and the five whys is a method of root cause analysis. And this is a basic question asking method with little analytical depth. It's used to explore the cause and effect relationship underlying a particular problem. It's used retrospectively, so again, it's not very, it's not uh, tailored or it's not suitable for looking uh, at, uh, at uh, the future. You apply it retrospectively uh, after the event and it starts with the accident or the incident to, term to determine why it occurred. And experience has shown that five layers are sufficient to establish the causal chain. And it's designed to be a simple problem-solving technique. And that's the power of it. It's quite simple. Uh, and again, you're using that intuition and reasoning rather than data-driven decision-making. So here's an example of it. And we go through uh, a number of them in the, uh, in the full lecture. So why did the student fail her studies? You need to be really, really, really careful in 
uh, the five whys, not to skip a level. You need to understand that's the question, what's the next level? Why did the student fail her studies? Because she did not have time to study. Why did she not have time to study? Because she was distracted by other activities in her life. Why was she distracted by other activities in her life? Because she did not set priorities and establish regular study, a regular study routine. Why, she, why did she not set priorities and establish a regular study routine? Because she lacked self-discipline to understand what was required. Why did she lack self-discipline to understand what was required? And the answer is because she did not appreciate the benefits of education and was more interested in other aspects of her life. So that's an example of the five whys. It's a very powerful but simple tool to use. Let's have a look at uh, one that's extremely well known. It's either called a cause and effect. Some people call it the fishbone and some people call it the Ishikawa analysis. And it was first developed by Kuru Ishikawa in the 1960s and he was an early advocate of, of uh, quality management. In fact, a, a, a disciple of Deming. It's sometimes called, as I said, cause and effect fishbone or Ishikawa analysis and its success relies on team members collecting information and data before discussing the problem. The starting point is that we need to clearly state the problem or the outcome desired. So if you and I are working on this uh, analytical tool together and you have, have uh, one outcome in mind and I have another, the, uh, the uh, process just doesn't work. So it's imperative that everyone agrees on the problem or the outcome statement before you proceed. So you use all of the tools available, the what, where, when and how, much questions, strengths, weaknesses, opportunities and threats analysis and other basic tools uh, such as histograms uh, and so on and so forth. Whatever information or data you can bring to the situation, you bring to the, uh, uh, the Ishikawa analysis. This uh, is uh, how it's structured. It's structured uh, at the, uh, the, uh, the right-hand side, the effect or the outcome, and off it. So it's the spine of a fish and the ribs off it. The ribs off it are each of the major causes or the causes and the sub-causes uh, of, uh, of the, uh, of, if it's an accident, the causes of the accident, or the effect that you want, uh, what will cause that effect, or the outcome that you wish to achieve. It, uh, Mr. Uh, Ishikawa, again, back to that thought about we all need to agree on what the effect or the outcome is that we want, said that there's only one head. The fish can only have one head. And so therefore you need to be very, very uh, careful to make sure that you have agreed what it is that you want to achieve, as I've said twice before. This is the standard headings uh, that Mr. Ishikawa uh, used in his paper. Uh, in this case, I'm using a Boeing 737 landing incident tire blowout on landing. And he used his standard categories for the ribs of the fish of policies from the top right, policies, procedures, equipment, bottom right, environment, people and methods. And then you allocate each of those um, parts of the, uh, or, or likely uh, causes of the accident, you then allocate them to the uh, various sub-causes uh, or the uh, smaller parts of the rim. And by that method you come up with a very informed view and a collective view of, uh, of the cause of the accident. You could use this type of analysis, for example, to purchase a new car, and some of your headings might be functionality, style and appearance, affordability, operating costs, technical aspects, or technical specifications, and accessories. And you map all of those out to come up with a decision. So let's move on now to SWOT analysis. Uh, it's a very well-known uh, tool. Uh, it has military origins, which we'll talk about in a moment. It's used in management to mind map a situation or problem. So again, uh, it's not, it's not uh, based on, uh, on uh, high levels of data collection or information. It's, it's uh, often based on gut feeling and the facts that you know them as of today. Uh, and if you remember from a previous uh, lecture, we call that constrained rationality. You're dealing with what you know right now. In a simplest form, it's designed to be a quick mental exercise to raise the issues which should be considered in making a decision. It can be used tactically, that is in response to uh, something which is required immediately, or strategically to uh, add 
to consideration of larger issues. And it assumes that you're seeking the best way forward given the prevailing circumstances. This is uh, the headings that we use in it, and this is where the term SWOT comes from. And strengths and weaknesses are both internal. Uh, the strengths are attributes of the organisation that are helpful to achieving the objective, and weakness are attributes of the organisation that are harmful to achieving the objective. And then opportunities and threats being external, opportunities are conditions that are helpful to achieving the objective, and threats are conditions which could do damage to the business's performance. As I mentioned earlier, this comes from the military uh, SWOT analysis, the concept originally, and has been taken into management. Uh, if we have a look at an example of a military a SWOT analysis, uh, looking at the strengths, 10 highly trained troops with weapons and strong motivation I have around me. Uh, I have limited quantities of supplies, including ammunition. My opportunities, it's a dark night, there's no moon, and I'm in very familiar territory. I know I know this terrain extremely well. But the threat is the, the uh, enemy is 100 well-trained troops with unlimited weapons and supplies. And so that leads me to the decision, because what analysis, again, is making, uh, making a decision. And it leads me to the decision to retreat rather than fight. This is a list of some of the things uh, for the internal analysis of strengths and weaknesses, and some of the things that you may use as memory joggers uh, to come up with, uh, with those elements. And again, for external analysis, uh, these are some of the points that you might consider to come up with uh, the elements there. Uh, SWOT analysis is uh, most famous uh, in the aviation industry uh, for Sir Richard Branson. Sir Richard Branson attributes, uh, he's always self-deprecating, uh, he's always saying, hey, look, I'm not well-educated, uh, I don't have a high intellectual um, quotient, uh, uh, but what I'm good at is relationships with people. But he attributes a lot of his uh, success to be extremely good at SWOT analysis and understanding uh, all of the elements sufficiently well enough uh, and also mitigate risk on the way through that we'll talk about later. Gap analysis. Gap analysis is really important uh, in the uh, aviation industry and it's uh, a technique for determining the steps to be taken in moving from a current state to a desired future state. And the gap analysis is looking at the attributes, competencies, performance levels of the current state uh, and identifying those attributes, competencies and performance levels of the future state and the difference between those two are the gap and that's what needs to be addressed. And again, you can document that process and work towards it uh, and also uh, use a, um, some change management strategies along the way, including a transition management plan. From a business success perspective, you're basically comparing our current performance with our potential future performance, and we ask ourselves two questions. Where are we now, and where do we want to be? Uh, common uses are examining marketing potential, product, uh, your product gap against uh, comparative examples or benchmarks, or measuring competitive advantage or disadvantage. So gap analysis, gap analysis, again, an important tool. So let's now move on and have a look at enterprise risk management. And if we go back to lecture three, you're, when we talked about decision making, we said decision making has three conditions. There's certainty, and uh, dealing with certainty um, is, uh, is, a, is the uh, highly desirable state. Uh, there's uncertainty, uh, which is the uh, worst situation because of the fact that uh, you uh, don't have all of the facts and you need to make a decision uh, knowing that there are things that you don't know. Uh, but risk, this is what this lecture about is about risk. It's about the enterprise level of risk, so that's at the organisational level. Uh, and it's where those uh, conditions in which the decision maker is able to eliminate the likelihood of certain outcomes. So the idea is to understand the risk, to identify it and to mitigate it, and that's what we'll talk about now. From an organisational or enterprise perspective, the principles of risk management need to be understood. And there's some steps involved, and they assist us to make informed judgments. And understanding the risks and how to mitigate them will reduce threats 
to the organisation. And on the right is uh, Murphy's Law, or anything that can go wrong will go wrong, and that'll definitely happen uh, unless, uh, unless you are fully aware of the risks, uh, organisational risks, that uh, your company uh, is taking. Now these definitions are quite wordy because they come from the Australian New Zealand standard and the international standard on, uh, on risk management. Uh, so let's have a look at risk. Uh, risk is the chance of something happening that will have an impact on the objectives. So it's about dealing with uncertainty which can have either positive or negative consequences. Risk management is a coordinated activities to direct and control an organisation with regards to risk. And the risk management framework is basically uh, the processes uh, of uh, surrounding your risk approach. Enterprise risk management, uh, that's uh, at the highest level of the organisation. It's applied in a strategic setting and across the enterprise. It's designed to identify potential events that may affect the entity and manage risk to be within the risk appetite to provide reasonable assurance regarding the achievement of entity objectives. So, again, lots of words, but what it means is if you don't have a risk management framework, uh, you, uh, you uh, are working uh, in, with higher levels of uncertainty in your organisation. Enterprise risk management sits above things like operational risk management, project management, financial risk management, and safety management systems, and so on. So from that perspective, uh, it sits at the higher level uh, and it's about the entire organisation. Some of the benefits, there's a lot of benefits uh, for, uh, for uh, conducting risk management and uh, in the full lecture I cover those. Traditionally, an iceberg has been shown to, uh, to represent risk. Uh, and uh, what you see at the surface, a little bit like root cause analysis, what you see at, surf at the surface isn't necessarily the situation underneath uh, if you traverse through those waters. And you can use uh, risk management, as we know, at all of those various levels of the organisation. So what's risk identification, uh, the philosophy about it? Uh, risk identification is the process of determining what, where, when, why and how something may happen. It requires the identification of hazards and treating them to reduce them to an acceptable or as low as reasonably practicable levels. And the residual risk is the risk remaining after the implementation of the risk treatment. Again, lots of words. What does it all mean if we look to the, to the, um, to the uh, diagram to the right? We see here the hazard is the larger man, similar to me. The larger man sitting on the seesaw, and the poor uh, other fellow is up in the air. And if you want to get the seesaw back into equilibrium, what you need to do is to apply some treatment to, uh, to the right-hand side of the seesaw. Well, you can do that by putting more people there or putting more weight there, for example, and you'll get it back then into equilibrium to the acceptable level. But if you can't treat it, if it's too expensive or it's, uh, it, it's, it's not viable, what you try and do is to reduce it as far as you possibly can. And this point is called as low as reasonably practicable, or ALARP. So you treat it there, but then you need to understand that you still have some residual risk that uh, you can't treat and you just need to manage it. And be aware that it, uh, it's there. Taking risks is a normal, unavoidable, everyday necessity. We do it crossing the road, for example. And it's unavoidable. Uh, taking informed risks is sensible and necessary. If I didn't take an informed risk about crossing the road uh, to come here to the studio today, I wouldn't be delivering this lecture. We can't eliminate risk, but often we can reduce its probability through education, planning and treatment. Let's have a look at the risk vulnerability profile. And this is where we plot on the y-axis the likelihood of something occurring from remote, unlikely, possible, probable. And on the consequence on the x-axis, uh, insignificant, minor, low, high, severe, and critical. And we're just using those as descriptors um, for uh, ease of reference. And we can work out where our organisation sits with regards uh, that. So when you're looking at risk, 
and its likelihood is remote and its consequences is insignificant, well, why worry about it? What you need to do is you need to get it back into uh, uh, manageable levels. If it's already past that manageable level, well, again, you don't need to expend resources on it. So where we do get concerned as managers is when the likelihood is probable and the consequences is high. So as a result of that, the management focus is in this quadrant. It's getting risk back to a tolerable level. Now, what I'm showing here are two risk vulnerability profiles of two different organisations. And what I'm saying is the one on the left is far more conservative and the one on the right uh, is much more confident of taking higher risks. You might say, for example, the one on the left, uh, the blue one is, say, a government agency, the Aviation Safety Regulatory Authority of the country, and the one on the right is a low-cost carrier. They have what is called different risk appetites. And they're, they're, uh, the uh, risk appetite is can, what can define the organisation. An entrepreneur is uh, more likely to take on risk, for example, than a bureaucracy. Uh, when we speak uh, in another course on uh, entrepreneurship, we find out that entrepreneurs say, hey, we do take on greater risk, but we study it far more closely, that risk, uh, than a government agency or a more conservative organisation would study. We know, uh, we acknowledge, and we understand those risks, and that's why we're good entrepreneurs. So, risk appetite. The risk management process, uh, like a lot of these things, it's a formal process. It's about establishing the context, identifying the risks, analysing the risks, evaluating the risks, and then treating them. And we communicate and consult, and we monitor and review. And the risk uh, identification process uh, and the analysis of the risk and their evaluation is most important. And I go through that in the full lecture. It's most important, seeing it's part of our quality system, but even just for accounting purposes, to record the risk management process. So you have an understanding of what our risk profile looked today, and in three months' time, six months' time, etc., you'll be able to re-examine your, uh, your risk, uh, your risk uh, situation and uh, modify it. Sometimes new risks come along and you need to treat those. Often you don't know what your major risks are. You often have a gut feeling, but when you sit down and actually start analysing it and comparing it against others, you'll often find that something you thought wasn't your highest risk is in fact your highest risk. So again, it's important to go through the process. The documentation and criteria for the risk management process is very dependent on its application. And there's both sorts of, uh, of qualitative analysis and qualitative analysis uh, that you can uh, conduct, from very simple to very complex systems. In its simplest form, the basic likelihood and consequence model uses a five by five matrix resulting in traffic light colour indicators, and they're extreme, moderate to high or low. And what you do is you work out your likelihood using those five criteria there or your consequences using those five criteria. And again, you may have definitions for what they mean in the context of your business. And then you come up with the red ones, which are, as we said uh, earlier, your extreme risks. Uh, the uh, amber ones are moderate to high risk and your low risk. And again, that indicates to you where you need to spend your resources to mitigate the risk. Generally, all of this documentation is putting, put in a risk register and uh, in this synopsis lecture, I won't go through it in any detail, but the learning point is that as you go through it and determine your likelihood and consequences and your risks level, that's before the treatment, and then you do it again after the treatment, and you can uh, hopefully mitigate your risks. So, the learning points from uh, this lecture are shown here. And that takes us to the end of the lecture on analytical tools and enterprise risk management. 
If you want to do some pre-reading in the text, next week we look at managing the airline business. So thank you very much for listening to Lecture 9, Analytical Tools and Enterprise Risk Management, and I look forward to seeing you again. Thank you.